ready to get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Melissa Craig, the Regional Manager of our U.S. office. Hope you all have been enjoying the presentation so far. This presentation is EA Roadshows, How to Communicate Value Company-Wide, and it's being brought to us today by Peter Brower at Aflac. Peter and Aflac have done a lot of great work over the past several months to implement Abacus and, and build up their EA practice. Um, and a big part of that has been communicating value throughout the company. And we're really excited to have him share some of his experiences with you. I think it's definitely gonna be, gonna be helpful and, and valuable for, for others to learn about. Um, I, I'm sure you're all experts at, at our housekeeping items by now after probably listening in on several presentations, but just as a reminder that we will have a Q&A period at the end of the presentation, and you can put your questions into the Q&A uh, facility at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So please feel free to enter those at any time and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Also, as a reminder, we are recording this presentation um, and the slides as well as that recording will be available to everybody in just a few days. So if you're ready to go, Peter, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you to get started. All right. <clears throat> can you all hear me okay? We can. Thanks. It's fabulous. So yeah, as a brief introduction, uh, my name is Peter Brower. I'm the Enterprise Business Architect at Affleck. Um, within the uh, Digital Services Enterprise Architecture Group. And uh, we did an evaluation about, started an evaluation about 18 months ago of uh, EA management tools and we settled on Abacus. And one of the first things that we were dealing with, what were the specific challenges, you know, within the organization that, that we had to deal with um, the first and foremost one being, you know, we've actually been around as an organization for quite a while and we didn't want it to just come out as here's a new tool with a bunch of pretty pictures, right? And, you know, how do we make them relevant? How do we get people to pay attention this time when maybe they haven't paid attention last time? Um, another part of it is, you know, you, you do a diagram for an audience and, um, or, or a roadmap for an audience and they really like it and they hang on to it. And that becomes their go-to model for the next seven or eight years. Um, and, you know, it, it, it becomes quickly um, obsolete. So, you know, how do we make them relevant and current and keep them that way? Um, another challenge that we were dealing with as we were really, you know, we called ourselves enterprise architecture and we functioned as enterprise architecture but there's still a lot of uh, shadow IT organizations within a company as large as ours uh, where they have pockets of, of information that they're not sharing or they don't even necessarily know they need to share. And then they don't understand, you know, how the information that they have or the services that they're using um, connect. And, you know, we would wind up with things like somebody would create, you know, a really amazing set of reports that were fabulous because that's not what we want to do in enterprise architecture, but it would turn out that they're linking to um, data sets that may be stale um, or even taken offline at a later point. So the data they're not using is not accurate or they would see a report that was derived from data. And so now they're using second and third hand interpreted data. They didn't understand the relationships across the organization. And that was a huge challenge that we would have to deal with. Um, <clears throat> going along with that is, you know, territorial, territoriality and, and, you know, what we call feudalism. There is some areas where they don't want to share. They've done some empire building, um, you know, in any large organization. Um, and then the territoriality part of it is, you know, the whole area, the whole thinking of, you know, this is, this is my area and I'm not going to share the data these are my tools that I paid for. Why should I pay for tools for another area or people, you know, for the information to be used in another area? And then, you know, the last big one is, you know, how do we engage with leadership and get them to fund the work? Um, you know, enterprise architecture is uh, not usually the first at the top of the funding list. It's, it's one of those ones where, you know, we, we get cut first or, you know, we have to really justify the money. So we had to show value for dollar. Um, so that was always a big one for us. The main challenge that we were dealing with <clears throat> was when you looked at 
you know, the areas of architecture and IT operations and, and DevOps as we're moving to that DevOps area and uh, the business part of it, we had no alignment. And so it always seemed like business had one set of priorities and, and IT was heading in the opposite direction. Um, not because of anything specific that we were doing. It, it's just how these things function because there wasn't anybody looking at that big picture and, and driving it forward and, and making it uh, uh, aligned. Um, so what we wound up with was completely valid priorities. IT's priorities, you, you couldn't fault them. Business priorities, you couldn't fault them. And so therefore, you know, the funding decisions were made, the staffing decisions were made. And when you would look at it, when you would do an interpretation of it, um, everything seemed to be great. Uh, the, the problem was, is that there was no alignment between these. So instead of actually being great, they wound up being in conflict with each other. Um, and so the, the, instead of complementary projects, uh, programs, resources, where the work that IT did supported the business and the business was um, driving IT's priorities forward, we had competing ideas and competing processes, um, even in current support for existing systems, but in future ideas. We would be looking at a technology direction one way, but because we weren't communicating and because we didn't have alignment, the business, which it turned out really would have the same kind of a need for a newer capability or newer technology, we would be, we would find out that they're looking at a different technology base. So you'd wind up, we're looking at something along the lines of a Microsoft Dynamics solution, and they're looking at Salesforce. Both are completely appropriate for the need, but they're not the same. And then, you know, who's making the investments and the communication and the management across the whole organization was always a challenge um, in dealing with these things. And so what we wound up with was what we called the business versus IT tug of war. And it was a virtual tug of war that was going on all the time every day, budget allocations didn't align. And you know, you would have the sales organization or the support organization or customer support, they're working on their funding and IT is working on their funding and we're just trying to justify dollars and spend is being done. Um, and again, in an organization as large as ours, um, it was very easy to not see these alignments, um, but still do the funding, still be delivering completely appropriate solutions but they weren't providing the value for the dollar to our users as we were going forward. And that was always something that would come up, you know, the following year. And then that makes next year's funding and strategic decisions that much harder. You know, you, you get into a meeting, a, a budget allocation meeting where somebody would be talking about, we've got this and we've done this. And then somebody else says, well, why should I give you another X number of dollars when I'm not seeing the value for dollar because I've got to spend more money to take what's being done over here and make it work for you, you'd think that these would, these would align. Um, and then, you know, even in that strategy, we had roadmaps, we had strategic plans, um, but they didn't lead to the same final destination. And that's always a, 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 a challenge that, that you see. I've, I've been at you know, several different large companies and several small companies and, and then spent years as a, as a consultant and I would see this all the time you know, the value of a roadmap isn't just knowing where you're going, it's knowing where you're starting from and understanding where you're starting is in relation to all the other starting points. So we're not saying that you need to know and be in control of all the different places that people are, you just need to have visibility to it and an understanding. Um, so you're sharing those information points as you're working across the organization. There's no big picture. There's no cohesive view to the organization as a whole. And this, these were the huge challenges that, that we were faced with um, within enterprise architecture in, in trying to show our value to the organization as a whole and justify our existence on the spreadsheets and really provide a level of service uh, that we wanted to get to. So the first thing that we needed to do was we needed to change the way the business thinks about things and what they're seeing and what they're doing. The first part of that in business architecture was we found that their perspective 
it was almost always on the application. And, you know, I've seen that in, in multiple organizations. I'm sure you guys have all too, where you don't think in terms of the service or the capability that you're providing. I need to provide call center capabilities to my organization. They think instead, I need to use Avaya to provide call service or I need to use SAP. We have SAP or JD Edwards. How do we provide financial or supply chain or, or any of these things? They're not thinking about what they're trying to do. They think in terms of the tools that they have. And what that does is it puts artificial limitations in place. That you start thinking about all the things that you want to do within the context of the tool that you already have or the tools that you already have. And that automatically puts artificial limits on your forward thinking capabilities. <clears throat> Instead of thinking about what I need to do, you start thinking about what can I do with the tooling that I'm currently provided with. There's an old adage, you know, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And that's really what we were dealing with. So it limited the forward thinking of the business. And it also stymied innovation within the organization due to these external factors that had nothing to do with the business need itself. So what we really needed to do was change the way the business thinks. So they were thinking, what do I need to accomplish first? Okay. Stop thinking about what they have and start thinking about what they want. What do they want to be able to do? What do they need to be able to provide to their customers? But the other part of that is IT thinks the same way from the other side of the coin. IT is also focused on the applications and the servers, but they're focused on them in terms of stability, making sure that they're patched, making sure that they are the current version, making sure that maybe they're the next version coming up. You know, the focus is on servers, not why the server exists in the organization, not the purpose of the application in the organization. Why do I have this system or that system? Instead, they're looking at it in terms of, I have to make sure that the system is running at optimal performance. Not, is it optimal performance for the business need? Is it optimal performance for the application itself? And the business doesn't understand the process dependencies, right? The business understands that they use a system to provide a capability or, or, or a set of processes. They don't understand also that System A connects to system B, which connects to system C or, or hardware or infrastructure or any of these things. So they don't understand when you start talking about a, a hardware server versus a virtual server, or they do, but they don't see the big picture. You know, there's always certain people in the business who are very technically minded and others that aren't. So, you know, you have to deal with that kind of a mindset and the users just also, they don't see the big picture. So these were the challenges that we were dealing with, and these were the specific needs that we were seeing within our organization that we had to deal with. So that gave us the opportunity. And what it was is we needed to really come up with a totally new approach, a new paradigm to provide these enterprise level views. And, and we refer to them now as moments of impact and their value propositions, which if you come into this from a, a business centric view or business architecture or business planning, you know, moments of impact and value propositions are really something that we talk about a lot in terms of customer service or dealing with our markets. Um, and that's really what we're looking at. IT's customer is the rest of the business. So we have to look at our moments of impact and what's our value proposition. And we found in looking at that, taking that approach when we were doing our selection criteria that Abacus really provided us with the tools for that that we needed not just for managing our technology, but how we were going to show the value and those touch points to the business. Um, you know, bottom line, our customers wanted to know what was in it for them in a way that they could understand. And by changing the focus to the value proposition um, for what IT is delivering, we were delivering more than just the pretty pictures to the, to the business and the, and the roadmaps and the diagrams. Um, so, we're not only able to manage our IT systems better and see those things and get the relationships, we're able to communicate the value of what we're doing to the business using the tool. And, and that was a huge win in our organization. Um, you know, going back to the, the, the challenges, once we were able to start doing this, 
we were really able to start showing people how their fish pond um, connected to the larger ecosystem of connected lakes and streams and rivers all the way down to our, our full enterprise and, and where their value was within the organization as a whole. So really what we're doing in this side, we have a group that's using you know, Abacus to improve our IT management and our IT spend and prioritization and all of those things. But we also want to use Abacus to improve our business decisioning and our strategy using our IT assets and resources. So we're using Abacus to do those things. We're using a meta model focused approach, not to look at <clears throat> the relationships as we're building the dependencies, but to broaden the perspectives and understand, and providing an understanding to the business of how their information flows and what those dependencies that they may not see under standard conditions in a much broader and more open perspective. This was huge, um, getting them to think about that. It's opened up all sorts of new communication pathways and, and how areas depend on each other. Um, it's also allowed us to improve communication. I'll show that a, a little bit later where um, we're putting faces to knowledge areas. And what we're winding up with is now the ability where instead of thinking in terms of, I need information from system X, it's I need information or data from this group. I don't really care how they get me the information, but this is the information I need. And this goes back to that first need that we identified uh, remove the reliance on the system and instead put the focus on what the business requirement is. This is a huge separation, something that we're trying very hard and, and we're gaining ground and we're gaining momentum as we're working through. And Abacus is really helping us to do this is we're moving away from this concept of the business needs applications. The business doesn't need applications. The business needs the services that are provided by applications. It needs the services that are provided by infrastructure. IT needs applications to run on services. So again, the, the application, the solution architects and the enterprise architects are now engaging better with infrastructure teams and also external vendors as we're moving to the cloud as we're moving to public and private cloud, as we're, you know, assessing new, you know, PaaS, SaaS, you know, infrastructure as a service, all of these things, we're, we're no longer going in and looking first at the solution and seeing if the solution fits the need. We're defining the need first, and then we're just basically saying, this is what our need is. Show me how you're going to meet it. Um, so people are coming in with this mindset, and it's really improving our delivery. Another advantage, and again, we'll talk a little bit more, is when we start getting into portfolio rationalization and system rationalization exercises as part of this. Um, but basically, all of these perspectives that we're getting now in this improved communication, it's improving this decisioning. We're understanding the impacts and ripple effects of the changes. You know, we now can say specifically, which has always been a challenge in any organization I've been at, um, you know, when, when your infrastructure folks say, I've got to take this server down to do this patch, we can use the meta model to understand and view out, well, if you do that, you're going to impact this specific business process. Let's talk to the business that owns that process, which now we go out to the roles and to the actors and the departments, and they come back and say, Great, I understand that, but I'm in the middle of a huge sales push right now, or I'm doing end of quarter reporting, or we've got a financial audit that we're in the middle of. Can you postpone, or can you tell me when you're gonna do it specifically so that I can adjust my staffing and, and shifts? And we're actually using this to drive down, we're beginning to see a decrease in issues where you know, we take a system down over here, and the business operations over there don't know it. And so that results in calls to the help desk and tickets being opened and fire drills and tiger teams being stood up 
when what it was was the server was down for or the the network link was down for support or maintenance or a patch or something like that. Um, so we're actually getting improvement and we're being much more proactive um, by understanding how these things flow through the organization as a whole. So that is now we're getting a, a, a risk reduction. You know, we're making sure that through this improved communication and better understanding of how these things relate, we're able to mitigate problems that we were having before that we didn't even realize we had. It was always reactive. Oh, I'm doing this, it's causing this problem. Another area that we're seeing that's been huge for us is in the strategic planning cycles you know, forward looking. Now we're looking at it from the beginning and saying, this is the big project for the next 18, 24, 36, 48 months. And we're not just looking at it from a technology pure view or a business pure view or secondary. We're able to have a much bigger picture and our PMs are able to understand when they start talking about a strategic program, who to invite into the room for kickoffs for discussions, even if they're only, you know, peripherally impacted or a secondary or tertiary partner, those ripple effects are understood where we can start really having a better plan and getting the right people involved. So we're identifying better the people to invite to the meeting. And we're also able to free up people who didn't necessarily need to be in a meeting, but they always get invited anyway. So it's improving efficiency. This has, for us, been huge. One of the, the, the major impacts and values that we're seeing here is AFLAC, due to COVID-19, has actually moved to, I believe we're now at 97% of our entire workforce, uh, over 10,000 people are working from home or working remotely. Um, so we're doing a lot of virtual meetings. We're doing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, asynchronous types of meetings using my, leveraging Microsoft Teams, leveraging other systems. So we have to be much more efficient in how we're doing these types of things um, and how we're reaching the right people and making sure that we have everybody involved in these discussions. Um, and we're actually leveraging this because we can understand those models better. So it's helping us to mitigate against the COVID risk that you know, we're all undergoing right now. So for these perspectives, we started with the meta model. And really the built-in meta model <clears throat> is a perfect roadmap for building out what you're gonna be using the tool for, but also um, understanding how the tool interacts. So this picture here is from the final version of the meta model. If you've looked at it in the tool, you've seen that there's actually um, level zero through three. <coughs> um, and really, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're doing this in an in a agile manner where we're, we have some areas after six months that are still effectively at level zero um, and others that are all the way to level three, again, depending on, on what type of information they have. But it does show the context in a logical structure, strategy and projects at the top with ideas in between, that's the bridge between strategy and project, capabilities, processes, services, and applications. Those are primarily the, the people interaction points um, with the supporting layer of infrastructure and information or data. The meta model, it, it provides a, an understandable visual set of connections and components and artifacts. So you can see, oh, <clears throat> this business process requires this application. This application is supported by this platform service or this infrastructure service or this server um, or this set of information. So we can now start seeing all of that. This role uses this application because it's performing this type of a process, but it owns the application. So we're starting to see and develop all those relationships. And the nice thing here is that all of the different areas are, are using their own kind of standards. So infrastructure applications, they're built around a CMDB kind of a construct and thinking. And, and the tool has the ability to, to interact directly with, with CMDBs if they're open or service now, Technopedia, those types of things. 
so we're not forcing the infrastructure folks or the, the solution architect folks to change their approach to their tooling or their thinking. They're continue to operate in a CMDB type of mindset. Capabilities, processes, services are based on an APQC model. Um, so again, that allows us to use another industry standard that, that really addresses the structures. And we've been working in that area for the last four years, um, building our capability models, building our process models. Um, we have the, the business process team is working in a tool called Signavio. They've built hundreds and hundreds of business process models already in BPM notation. And you know, the process layer is BPM compliant. Um, at the same time, the strategy layer, our engagement folks and strategy folks have been really, you know, we've been working on journey maps and business motivation models and all of that. And that's how they think. So we don't have to change the way anybody thinks or views their business operating model, their business processes. Instead, we're able to integrate directly into what they're doing. And so what we did <clears throat> was we took the operating model, we took the meta model. And then what we did was we identified where those affinities were and where the alignments were. So leadership is strategy. Um, human resources and our human resources management systems, they're the people layer. Uh, purchasing and legal, you know, that's our, our uh, uh, supplier and contract area. Our infrastructure group, the CMDB, our information architects, they're working in Irwin and they own the information layer. Enterprise architects are concerned with the services and the applications, so they're focusing there. Uh, business architecture is, is capability, process, and services. But our business relationship management and business process management team are focused directly on the processes themselves. And then our, our strategic execution model office and our, our project model office, or CMO and PMO, they're focused on that project area. <clears throat> and so this, <coughs> excuse me, this is how we were able to address going back to that, that concern about that territoriality. Um, we're not trying to take over what they're doing. We're not trying to change what they're doing. What we're trying to do is show where their critically important functions and operations fit into the big picture. Using the meta model in this approach, we were then able to also say, oh, well, you've got a question about X look at the, the, the person from HR and now we'll understand the role. So, so now when we do a project and the project makes a, a change to a process, which is gonna require a change to a service, which is gonna require a new application, we understand that there's now direct impacts to the roles of the people. And these, a lot of this is stuff that, that we kind of know and exists as tribal knowledge in our organization, but by putting it in paper, uh, you know, digital, um, but by putting it as a picture that people could see, now you understood why you were being included in meetings or who you needed to include in meetings and when you needed to include them because each one of these nine boxes represents roles that are critical to the organization and really seeing how we're going to work with this to, to improve our delivery. So... And that was the, the, the framework improvement to understand better um, how we're going to get value from the other areas and, and how they're going to provide their value. How the team interacts as a whole um, to really make sure that we've got a full delivery picture. So using that, we take the model and we slice it, right? So again, going back to this previous picture here where you see the business architecture, which is kind of the start of it, right? Where the business on the strategy and project layer, they've identified what they wanna do. And so now we're talking capabilities, processes, and services. So now that's where the business focus is. This goes back to that whole discussion about, you know, we don't want the business to think in terms of their application. We want the business to think in terms of what do they need to do? What can't they do today? What do they want to do tomorrow? What do they want to change? And <clears throat> by looking at it at this layer, we've narrowed the focus. We're not taking the things off the page and we'll present this actual picture to people. 
but we've got a focus group. We've got a strategy meeting. We've got a planning meeting where we're working with the business um, and, and we're identifying the priorities and we're, we're coming up with, in our case as an agile shop, <clears throat> we're defining our themes, we're defining our epics, we're defining our backlog items. What are the features that we need to do? And all of these things are being done in a platform agnostic manner that allows us to really drive forward what it is we're trying to accomplish. Um, we can show them how important their function is and then how they're going to maintain the control of that. We're not taking process, work instruction, how things are being done away, but we are looking at how what they're doing may need to change and then working with them on that. What is the, the service that they need to change? What's the capability that we already have? The other thing is by separating out that service layer from the application layer, now we're, we're on the back half of this doing platform and, and program rationalization, application rationalization, where if we have a really good understanding of what they need in an organization, especially as large as something like an Aflac or a Coca-Cola or a Boeing, there's already, you, know, you can almost guarantee that for any business application need out there, there's already an existing application within the organization that's doing it. It's just doing it in a different area or it's doing it a different way. So now we can start seeing what is it they need to do? Do we already have a system that does it? Where is that system in the life cycle? And is it something that we want to leverage or is it something that we want to replace? It also helps us by taking this type of a picture and do some rationalization and standardization on the processes themselves. You know, the business always comes to the table saying, well, our processes are totally different than anybody else and we are completely different. Um, we're a world unto ourselves. And really what it is, is it's how they do it may be different, but what is the business outcome that they're trying to achieve? That's very similar. So they can maintain control of that, but we can get the picture to see, you know, this group does something very similar based on outcome. How do we improve their process based on what you're doing or based on your pain point? Is there another area that we can leverage? And again, doing it this way and showing it in the meta model, the data remains the source, <clears throat> whatever the data is. Um, and instead we're using Abacus to illustrate the relationships between these areas. Is it a use? Is it a requires? Is it a contributes to? Is it a consumes or owns? What are the relationships as we go through these places and understand it? And now we understand the relationships off of the focus area and we know who to talk to. So this brings it down to a lower level where now we're looking at a process which needs a service, that service needs an application. We know what solution architect. We know what contract to look at. We know what area in HR. So instead of looking at the really larger area, we're looking at a more, more granular area and understanding again, the execution team. So we're able to build those in a more efficient and better manner as we're going forward. We take the same thing and it's allowing us to teach the business to think in terms of the capability and process model. You know, what do they need to do and how do they need to do it? Not what are they doing, but what do they need to do? They need to understand the business. This is going back to, you know, the need of changing the way the business thinks, right? and change the way IT thinks. Now, the business is a consumer of IT services. They're not a consumer of IT applications. They define their services that they need, and then they can assign to that service, service level agreements. And now we move away from the application. We've delivered applications in IT for years that are completely perfectly maintained and completely properly managed that don't meet the business need. And we have that conflict between the tug of war between IT and business. But now instead of focusing on the application delivery, we're focusing instead on the service delivery using this meta model. The service level agreement is based on the service, not based on the application. So now IT has the ability to say, 
I can provide that service with a different application and the business shouldn't care. As long as we're providing the service that they require, that's the value proposition from IT, right? And so this is the business that's able to continue to return the value and meet their customer needs and their shareholder values propositions, right? That's that moment of impact is that services layer. So we can take that same view on IT side and now we understand these are the services we need to deliver. So the value proposition is enabling that service layer. What do we need to do in IT to meet that service requirement, to meet that service level agreement, to make sure that we're delivering what the business needs. We're segmenting this meta model with the overlap area, the, the, the relevant area, right? is that services layer in this picture, in this approach. So everything below the services layer should be a black box to the business. As long as we're enabling the services that are required and meeting their functional and non-functional requirement needs. And now we start seeing how the organization relates to itself, you know, in these different areas and why you do need to talk to the, the, you know, the database folks when you're looking at a services or, or why you need to talk to your network engineers as part of a, a service delivery, you know, and, and they understand now <clears throat> they're not just providing network access. <clears throat> they're not just providing data information. Now they understand why they're providing it and what the, the purpose of it is and what the delivery is. And so they become begin to see how important they are in providing not just services to the internal organization, but end user services to the customers. So this becomes that moment of impact. The moment of impact here is that service layer. This is that overlap point. We've taken the different perspectives using the meta model here, uh, <clears throat> and we're showing where the, the, you know, what's important to me, where they intersect. This was a huge aha moment to both the business and IT when we were showing these models. And, and in this case, it wasn't even necessarily having a big meeting with the business people on one side of the room and IT on the other. It was just showing these conversations and understanding where these things came from and understanding where the requirement was because we get requirements all the time and we don't really understand the context of the requirement. You say it needs to be available seven by 24, 365. That's a business requirement. I've got an IT requirement that I have to be able to take that system offline at least one hour a month, every month to do some backups, some server patching, whatever, you know, the standard maintenance types of things. Um, so how do I work with the business? Well, now I can see that this business, this service is consumed by this process. Okay, do you do the process on Sunday night into Monday morning from you know 11 o'clock to three in the morning? Now I've got a service window that I can use to do the things that I need to do much better and we can have those conversations and I know exactly what I'm gonna be impacting. On the business side, I can plan better. On the IT side, I understand if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it in a way that's not gonna have a negative impact to the business. It's, those are those moments of impact. When I'm doing something, is what I'm doing going to impact another area of the organization or an area outside the organization, right? So if I'm looking at changing a supplier or a contract, can I do that without causing an impact to the business? If I need to change a VM, is there a way for me to change a VM where it's completely transparent to the, to the business users? Now I understand that I can do these types of things without a moment of impact and still provide value and, and still meet my service level agreements that I have in place. Um, so now instead of IT being seen as a necessary evil, it's, it's truly an enabler of what the business is trying to do. And now we have that alignment between the business and IT, okay? So we've now used this whole meta model approach 
we don't have competing priorities. We have different priorities that are in alignment with each other to provide the proper level of value to the organization. IT can do all of the things that it needs to do. And in fact, IT now can be moving forward strategically. Um, I understand the services that are necessary for the business to do what it needs to do. And maybe I've got systems that provide those services today, but by decoupling the service that's being provided from the application providing it, I now in IT have the ability to say, I'm going to improve your service. I'm going to improve your speed, your response time. I'm going to do portfolio rationalization and eliminate some older apps because I can provide the services that those older apps are providing in a different manner. Um, so now I'm reducing my IT spend and my IT costs, which is always a good thing. The business can be thinking ahead and saying, six months from now, a year from now, this is a service that I need to be able to provide to make sure that I'm relevant in the marketplace. I don't care how you do it, but this is what I have to do. So the business can be thinking in terms of this is what I want a year from now, 18 months from now. And IT has runway to simply say, this is what we're going to do. And we avoid the constant battle of the business coming in and saying, this is what I need to be doing six months from now or a year from now or 18 months from now. And our manager was just at a conference and saw this really cool tool and has decided to spend $3 million on it. And we're bringing it in and it's a Java-based application and we're a completely .NET shop, right? Or it's, this is a great system, but oh, I didn't happen to mention that it runs on the AS400 and you have no AS400 technology. You know, the, the, the trade show mentality and those types of things, we're, we're getting away from those types of, of, of needs. Instead, the business comes back and says, we were at a conference, we saw this really cool capability, we wanna be able to do that. This is what it has to look like. Show me how you're going to do it. So that's that gap between our current service offering and the business needs, right? What does the business need to do that they can't do now or that they have put a bunch of manual processes in because what we're delivering today, the capability from IT that we're delivering today doesn't meet the business needs. So the business has done, you know, huge workarounds or they're, they're, pulling data out to throw it into an access database running on somebody's desktop somewhere, right? So that they can generate a report so that they can do lead management and lead tracking. Those types of things. We, I, we see those gaps better now. So the key takeaways, right? We basically had lost sight in, in enterprise architecture and in IT as a whole that things are really understood from the user's perspective only, right? They don't see the big picture and, and we've not really provided a great tool to give them that big picture. So this was one of those, yeah, we knew that, but we kind of forgot it. So we call that a relearning in our organization. The meta model approach allows that ownership idea to remain where it belongs, right? At whatever the source is. If I'm looking at a process model, they still own the process model. I'm not changing your processes um, for the sake of IT. Now I may change my process because it's inefficient, but they own that. And now they can say, I need to change my process because it's problematic and that process will require these new services. Instead of coming back and saying, IT saying, well, we're changing the application platform so you need to change all of your work operations. We want to get out of that model entirely. And we're looking at an integration to rather than a migration from the different repositories. This was a huge win for us as well. Um, instead of migrating off of CMDB to another platform, which then in architecture, we have to maintain. <clears throat> and so now we're not gonna get them off CMDB, but we want the CMDB data. Now we've got redundancy. How do we keep the data in sync? Who's in charge of managing it? But instead we use the Abacus tool and the built-in APIs, which I know is being covered in another session, to integrate to CMDB as the data source. We're building integrations to another tool called Aptio to get financial information. We're building integrations to our project management and execution office so that now we have 
you know, effort and time and all of those different pieces of data coming into the singular model in Abacus, and we understand the relationships and we can build that big picture. But the maintenance of the data itself is not our responsibility. All we have to maintain is what the relationships are and what the connections are. And taking this approach, everybody sees their value in the organization of a whole, right? They know how important their information is. They understand how important information from other areas is and why they need it and where do they get it. And that's just a huge win because it builds that whole team concept of an idea. So that's really what, you know, we're talking about. And, and we discovered that, you know, without any context or perspective, it's just data, it's not information and data doesn't have value, right? We used Abacus to look at everything from the different perspectives and provide the views going forward. Those catalogs within it, they're the data, right? The matrices and relationships understand the connections between the data. Um, and then the slicing of the meta model allows us to really see the perspectives of how all of that fits together, right? So it's a, we, we call it our context engine. How do the things align? We leverage it constantly to provide the visibility um, and for people to understand. And we're getting now that we've been sharing this, people are coming to us and asking for new relationships and new uses, right? And, and they're coming to us with dependencies that we didn't see before. Um, that now we're able to quickly respond to questions about, you know, ideas or strategy, uh, strategy alignment. You know, we have the innovation office. Um, going back to the, the, the meta model earlier, I'm gonna pull up that picture, you know, the first picture here, you know, they're up here in the idea area. So now you know, innovation is up here and, and they have goals to provide value. They're understanding all the way down to here and they're able to ask that question up front before we get to anywhere. I have an idea to do something. Do we have the necessary hardware pieces? We can answer the question or actually through the, the web tool itself, um, they can answer the question and they can start seeing whether or not we have the necessary technology supports for what they wanna be doing. Um, and that's been a huge win for us as an organization. So that's the, the, the presentation that I have as a whole. I think it leaves us some time for question and answer if there's any. Yes, it, it absolutely does. And we do have some questions and, and folks, please feel free to continue entering in your questions to the Q&A um, facility at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So first question, Peter. Um, back to your to your meta model. Is it recommended to communicate and explain what a meta model is to, to business teams and executives, and to highlight what is in it for them? So should should they should people get into that level of detail with their business teams and executives? Absolutely, and, and you know that was one of the the points that I was um, I, I kind of touched on is if you look at the meta model capability. Um, in the Abacus tool itself, there's actually four diagrams and four pieces of the tool. The meta model level zero is, is really just, hey, these are the capabilities we need to provide. Here are the processes. It's at a very macro level. Here's the applications we have, and here's the data below it, right? And, and here are people. Um, that I think most organizations do understand. And that's kind of your level zero to level one. Level zero is just gathering those data right? Putting it together into the meta model. And that's where you start those discussions. Okay. Um, and explaining, okay, now we're taking that and we're making it abstract. You've got a process of processes as an application. Now we're going to go from specific process A and application A to say, basically everything works that way. A process needs an application or applications. So that's modeled here. And this is what the process uses this application for, or that application for. Um, we're also at the same time, we're introducing concepts around things like value stages, um, which, you know, together make a value stream, which deliver value to the organization. So we can start doing all sorts of learning that way. Then level two or level one is where we start saying, okay, this application provides this service, this application provides that service. And so as you work through the maturity, 
getting to, we're at about a level one to two right now because we've only been doing this for about nine months. The pictures that you were showing, we use those to communicate, but those are level three. And that's really that end level where people totally get all the points in, in the, the model. And that's gonna be dependent on your areas. Some areas got this right away. Other areas, we've been having the same conversations for months and we keep needing to revisit it. So yeah, absolutely. You gotta teach them what a metal model is and how it works. Great. So another, another question related to, to meta models, even though you now use built in meta models, do you still find yourself altering it to fit your exact enterprise specifications? We use, so <laughs> I, that was a, a, a major effort on my part. I took the out of the box meta model tool from Abacus and I went in and yes, I changed terminology to align to our terminologies. Right. Um, we don't use, you know, there are some places where just naming conventions are a little bit different and in, in how we call things. We don't call things a process, we call things a work instruction. Okay, so in our labeling, our labeling is different. Um, we don't have a PMO, we have a SEMO, Strategic Execution Management Office. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of those types of things that you're gonna go in and you're gonna do some, some grooming um, of the meta model at different levels. And so yeah, that was a huge thing. And that was actually really important. That's a really good thought. I, you know, sorry I didn't cover that. Again, it's only works if it's relevant to the people looking at it. So one of the things that we were trying to do was not force people to learn new terms, to learn synonyms, or to think in a way different from how they currently think. It was taking what they currently think and see and putting it into the larger context. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And that's probably really important to, to showing value is, is ensuring that it's in a, in a language and terminology that's really relevant to, to the language they're speaking. So I think that's a right. great point. Yep. Excellent. So what, another question, what kind of further capabilities of ab Abacus, like road mapping, project or portfolio management, application transformation, collaboration, et cetera, are you using? We're using the full suite. Um, I mean, seriously, we're, we're using this in our strategic planning office um, and, and execution, we're, we're using it not only to identify um, our areas of touch, but we're using it in the planning areas. Um, you know, to, to, as we're doing, uh, here's a strategic idea and we're, we're coming up with the execution model, that's the capabilities, here's the business that we're gonna be touching, here's the capability, uh, here's the processes that we have or that need to change or new. Um, as we're doing acquisitions, we're applying all of these things to acquisitions. So that comes into portfolio rationalization, our technology roadmap, our technology strategy, those types of things. So we're working there. Um, as we're dealing with, with a, uh, a transformation to the cloud, we're looking at the, um, you know, the, the, the suppliers and contracts to the infrastructure and the service layer and the platform service layer. So we're working with it there. Um, as we're making a transformation also to a digital first approach. You know, we're looking at the whole HR roles, departments and organizational units to how they work. Um, that's been a huge one for us in the COVID-19 world. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we went from uh, less than 5% work from home to 97% work from home as an organization. That had a huge impact to processes and work functions and operations. And this has really helped us understand how those things change and what the impact is to the roles and the training and the tooling that they need. Yeah, that's really important. So another question, how were you able to change IT's understanding of why certain applications were necessary within your organization? Well, that really goes back to um, that, that, that understanding in the meta model. I'm gonna go back to the picture here. Um, Sorry, I went too fast. Right here. Um, <clears throat> this layer of that meta model, you've got applications and you've got platform services, and then you've got application variants within that. This layer is usually what the IT thinks of, and this is also really where the business has always thought traditionally. They don't think in terms of the services being provided, 
They just think in terms of the applications and what they use the applications for. So once we started talking about, you know, uh, it's almost like doing a, a five wise root cause analysis type of approach. Okay, this is the application. Why does this application exist? Okay, that it exists to enable this business process. Okay, why does it exist to enable this business process? Because we need to do this. Oh, okay. Now that we understand that and we take that all the way down, we can start saying, now, hey, do we have other applications that provide that same service? Or do we have applications that do a really poor job of providing the service that we can improve? So it was really, once IT started seeing how the business uses what they have, we got out of the, I need this application to enable the business and moved to, I need to provide this service to the business. What's the best way to provide the service? And that was a huge IT aha moment for us was again, seeing that separation because now this has actually empowered a lot of our IT folks, um, our solution architects and our, our developers who've built applications who know in their heart of hearts my application can do so much more and provide so many more things in the organization. Um, but I, I can't communicate how it does that. Now they can point to it and say, this application provides the same service at half the cost or twice the speed, or you know, it, it improves the process. And at the same time, we're looking at the process layer down saying, this is really what I'm trying to, this is the service I need to enable the process. I'm able to, Concrete example, we had over 3,100 business processes identified in the organization um, as a whole. We sat down in a room with the business and really dug into it. And it came down to, there's actually 29 business processes that we have. We have analyze, we have communicate, we have validate, you know, we have receive, we have, you know, adjudicate all sorts of different things around this. But basically, it's 29 types of business processes with different inputs and outputs. But basically, the entrance and exit criteria are always the same, right? Just with different variables. Well, once we started doing that type of a rationalization at the process layer, now we understand the services. And now, from the IT side of it, we have that same rationalization. These are the services I need to provide. And I've got 17 applications that provide this service to different processes. Can I get down to four? I've got 17 different processes that need the service. And I've only got one application that provides that service. The service is a business critical service and the application I have supporting it ain't that good. I've got stability issues or I've got age issues or technology issues. Um, so now I start looking strategically that's an area of risk. That's what I need to look at putting on my roadmap to improve. Great. So Peter, as, as you've been expanding this out throughout your company, what is, what's some of the feedback that you've gotten um, as you've tried to demonstrate the value? And do you have any top lessons learned that you can share with the group? The main feedback that we've gotten is honestly, this is amazing. Why haven't we been doing this? Um, or, now I understand why. Um, there's a lot more of the, well, now I understand, you know, our, our we, we call them resource managers and a resource manager is kind of the liaison between the project leader and the, the agile teams. And they understand who has to be invited. Um, and there's always been that pushback where we, we deliver a project and it's only, you know, three weeks before your, your delivery date. And all of a sudden you realize that you didn't include this group or that group and you can't deliver without it. And they, you know, you're 18 months into a, a major effort, right? We're getting ahead of all of that. Um, so that has been the major feedback and the major learning that we have is we're, we're, we're able to be so much more proactive and so much more planful and get this on people's radars way upstream of, of when we need them. And so now we have a lot fewer surprises. Excellent. Great. 
And so that brings us right up to just about the end of, of our time together. Thank you so much, Peter. That was that was really informative and, and really great information. Uh, great to hear how you've been been trying to demonstrate the value, which I think is is really important for everybody. Um, and thank you to to all of the attendees for for joining us on this session.